Um, the purpose of Zappos is probably the most beautiful purpose statement I've ever heard. And that is to live and deliver wow. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of the Jeff Heilman Project. We have a new guest this today. We have Mike Williams with us. And Jeff, could you please introduce us to Mike? You could, we've been good friends for a while now, and I can't even remember how long ago it was when we were in Ojai and cutting that first podcast that you'd ever been on. Late January of 2014 pretty sure. And you talked about playing professional golf. You talked about getting yep. things done. Yep. So would you care to introduce us Absolutely. to Folks, Mr. Williams? We have we have been talking about this. And in fact, if we go all the way back to the very beginning, the yeah. first time I was ever invited to be on a podcast was by the guests that we have here today. So um, it's the first podcast I ever did. I think it went over 120,000 downloads. Thanks to some incredible marketing from the company that, uh, that Mike how, was working with. How did you with guys even meet? We're going to get into that in just a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so folks, we have Mike Williams with us today on the Jeff Heilman Project, and we've been wanting to have him on as a guest for several months, and it's basically just been, try- anytime you're doing something new, if you have a new job, you have a new house, you have a new baby, there's going to be things that take time to get into a rhythm. And so Mike's very busy with travel schedule and his consulting business that's continuing to boom and, um, and I've been trying to get my head wrapped around uh, a regular cadence with the folks that we want to have on the show. So um, a quick introduction for Mike, and then I want to have him kind of go into to some of the stories of things that, uh, that would be interesting for you as our listeners to hear about. But um, effectively, we have a business professional who used to work for GE um, in a very structured corporate environment. Who, uh, who broke bad, if you will, and joined us all here on the dark side of the force as entrepreneurs. First, as the senior leader under David Allen, as the CEO of the David Allen Company for a period of time. And then since then, in his own consulting practice leading up to and including his New York Times bestselling book, Doing to Done, which we'll be talking about. And uh, this is basically going to be two time management nerds geeking out on a podcast (laughs) together about the ins and outs of and the thrill associated with the uh, increase in personal productivity that come with, for lack of a a, a better term, a generic term, standard operating procedures. And by, by developing standard operating procedures, what Mike and I have both found both individually and collectively together is that you can really get pieces of your life to sort of fall into place. And uh, as we recognize that there's really no such thing as balance, there's only left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, and that any balance we would actually find comes from the toggling back and forth between two extremes, whether it's sleeping or working really hard, taking a wide angle view of your life and all the projects you want to accomplish or a focused five minute bit, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. It's the contrast between those kind of warring parties, left brain, right brain, what have you. So we have a a fantastic show for you guys today, probably one of our top five all time in the interview today with Mike Williams. And um, I'm going to go back to uh, how we met and then I'm going to hand the ball over to Mike and, and maybe have him tell, tell a little bit from his side of the story. Um, but if, if we go back in my personal history, in 2008, my brother called me out of the blue. Uh, I think he's probably called me three times in his whole life. And he calls me out of the blue and he says, um, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And I said, sure, I'll go anywhere you want. You know, I'm grateful to hear from you. He's very shy. And uh, I said, I'll go anywhere you want. And he says, great. And I said, what, what in the world got you to call me to have me take you to lunch? And he says, well, it was on my next actions list. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what's that? Anything that would prompt my brother to pick up the phone and call me, I'm interested in. Well, the next actions list um, could be that could be a generic term, but in this case, it was not generic. It was a specific portion of a standard operating procedure for time management by the author, David Allen. And David Allen built a large consulting business, which Mike Williams ended up running as the chief executive officer. 
And um, in 2008 and nine, I started to work through implementing the Getting Things Done Standard Operating Procedure for Time Management. The tagline in the book is The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. And that was a huge promise for me. And I'm, I'm the kind of person who believes in major transitions. I've had transitions in my life spiritually. I had a transition in my life when I got a vision for you and met you three weeks later on a blind date and we got married in 90 days. I've had transitions in my life going from no children to seven children in professional golf in startups that make tons of money and bring us out of poverty in, in what feels like a weekend. So I'm a big believer in these fulcrums, this concept of small hinges swing big doors. And to, to that degree, I'm not that I'm always looking for the next thing, but I'm always looking for ways to get things better. And if there are promises made and can actually be delivered upon with content that show standard operating procedures that would provide those types of transformations, I'm all in. And it was that context of working through David Allen's getting things done book that got me along the lines of thinking about, hey, how can we do things in a, in a more fluid manner and method? And then if we fast forward a couple of years to 2014 in January, Jessica's parents had moved down to Palm Springs and we were driving back from one of our long road trips to go visit them. And we left a little bit later in the day than we wanted to leave. And as a result of that, we weren't going to make it all the way back to San Jose before, you know, midnight. And I just don't like driving at night with the kids in the car. It's not safe. And I, I don't know. I wake up so early. I don't do well driving at night. So we pull off and Jessica's looking on the phone for places to stay. We pull off the road and we go up the hill to this little town in central California, uh, north of Los Angeles called Ojai. And I, I remember thinking, this is a town I've heard of, but I don't know anything about it. But why have I heard of it? Because I don't know anybody that lives there. I looked on LinkedIn. I didn't know anybody that lived there. And then that night while I was sleeping, it came to me. That from the back of the book jacket, from getting things done, it said, David Allen, Ojai, California. And I thought, could it be? <laughs> Does he really live here? Would it be possible to meet such a person? And if he's able to take this interrupt-driven opportunities to expand your life, uh, literally, perhaps he would not mind if I stopped by his office in, in Ojai, California. So uh, excited to, for the potential to meet David Allen, but not expecting anything because he's busy. He travels. Um, I went to the office knocked on the door, and lo and behold, within a few seconds, the CEO of the David Allen Company, Mike Williams, appears. Happy to greet me, <laughs> and seemingly unperturbed in the slightest, it being interrupted in the middle of a workday. And uh, so from that point, I've been talking here for 10 minutes, maybe, maybe longer. Uh, Mike Williams, I will turn it over to you from that moment that we met. What is your side of the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember receiving you in the office and uh, we had a wonderful conversation and, and actually one bit of the conversation that stuck with me for a long, long time and got replayed, you know, in my world after you left was a conversation that you and I had about your golf career mm -hmm. and you were relating a story to me kind of, uh, it was kind of a parable, if you will, that, um, hey, Mike, if I step up to a green and I hit a shot, you know, to you, you might think it's, it's, it's a perfect shot. But for me, and if there's another pro right next to me and they see the shot, we will both know everything that went wrong with that shot. That's right. And um, so that story has always stuck with me because I, I kind of uh, hope to elevate to that level of capability and this discipline called, uh, you know, productivity, whatever you make of that. And, um, you know, my job is to help people see the practice within the practice. And um, as a golf pro, you know, that there's a, a practice within a practice, and then there are five practices within that practice, and then there's a technique within those practices. So I am endlessly thrilled and um, curious about the, the small wins that create big impacts for people over time. And that's, that's just a question I've been pursuing as long as I can remember. Ever since 
And I'm going to segue in another story real quick. Ever since my dad put up a hoop on our one car garage in upstate New York, he handed me a basketball and we, we had a long driveway and it had two ruts in it. So there's just one spot where you could get a really true shot. And that was the foul line. And that's where I first learned about the practice within the practices, practicing foul shots in, in summer, fall, winter, spring, with gloves on, with gloves off, all that kind of stuff, where you learn the, the form and then you learn the form within the form. And then you learn that the practice produces the outcome. If you're outcome focused, then things might go squirrely. But if you if you really concentrate on the mechanisms that produce the outcome, that create the conditions for something to emerge, then you know really cool stuff can go on. So I didn't have all this language at the time to know that that was what I was doing. But when we met, you know that came back flooding back to me. Your story just reinforced the value of that. So. Um, you know, that's kind of the essence and the spirit that I think you and I have carried since that time. Yeah. An endless pursuit of the practice of the practice, an endless curiosity of what's going on, what's working, what's not working today. So um, that's my side of the story. And I think it's important, Jeff, for you to also acknowledge the fact that, you know, these are moments in time and we are always encouraging our listeners to just go see, like try something like, like you saw an address on the back of a book and you happened to be in that town. Or yeah. when we, yeah. when we reached out to, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I don't remember their names. The authors of uh, Freakonomics. Oh, uh, Thomas. Uh, yeah. yeah. So anyways, anytime we, anytime we read a really good book, deniability. anytime we, book anytime we read a really good book, we always want to make sure to email the CEO, email whoever's Friedman. listed. Thomas Friedman. Yeah. Email whoever's listed. Stop by if we can and just say thank you because, yeah. because I don't know that, you know, you're a, you're a very successful author. David Allen's very successful. I'm sure that they get a lot of people asking them and you guys get a lot of people asking you to do stuff for them, but probably not as many people saying thank you for what you did. And we just want to make sure that we acknowledge how grateful we are that you put yeah. in the time, you put in the effort, you put in the hours. And if we can just stop by and even just say thank you in person, it's, oh my it's something that we always try to do and yeah, encourage David, others. David Allen's work and the work that you continued to propagate during the, during the, years when those publications and seminars and YouTube videos started to become available completely transformed my productivity in life. I mean, there's no way it's not even like a day goes by without me thinking about <laughs> David Allen stuff. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't have the life that we have today with the seven kids and the big house and the cars. And more importantly than all of that stuff, although nothing's more important than you and the kids, but the peace of mind that says that I don't have to live a life trapped inside of a body that doesn't know how to discharge random thinking about things that I can't keep track of. That yeah. that's yeah, just that, that's the, key. the yeah. best, right? That total calmness and peace of mind. Um, yeah. and, uh, I have so many questions that I want to ask you that I actually did some meditation just to try to calm down before this, <laughs> well, let's do before it. this, because let's I just it. off the charts excited. So you got to now for the folks listening, you know, some people don't know who Seth Godin is. I don't know where they live. They'd have to live under a rock in my opinion, but, mm. um, you know, the Seth Godin's or the David Allen's or you know, I'd have the Dan Rome. We got to get Dan Rome on here I know. too. Um, when I called Dan Rome up. And invited him to lunch after his first, after his second book came out, um, and we got to sit down up in San Francisco and have lunch with him. I took Jessica with me to that one. I know you know Dan very well as well, and a lot of the stuff that I see in your book is actually uh, uh, reflective of of the things that Dan Rome has taught. You know, you you may you folks out there listening, you may not all know who Simon Sinek or Dan Rome or Mike Williams or David Allen are, um, and some of you do, probably a lot of you guys do if you're listening to this podcast. But um, if I think about David Allen, how many years did you work for him when you were both living in Ohio before he moved to uh, Europe? Uh, worked for him five years. Five years. Okay. And were you fresh off the corporate bus from GE or did you have something in yeah. between? 
Yeah, no, um, um, I left GE specifically to go work for David and the, the David Allen company. And even prior to that, David and I were, were in conversation and, and when, whenever he'd come to the Northeast, we'd get together okay. at the seminars that he was delivering. So your, so your yes, association after, with him began, tell, tell us about your association with David Allen. How'd you get to know him? Um, well, uh, let's see here. So my origin story of all of this is actually sitting down for a date night with my wife, her sitting across the table and me for the life of me not being able to pay attention to her because I had so much stuff on my mind. Mm. So much so she says, hey, you know, what's up? Your body's here, but you're not. <laughs> Where yeah. are you? And that was the line of demarcation for me where um, prior to that, I probably had what I would describe as brute force productivity. I could work more hours. I could stay later. I could get there earlier. I could work on the weekends. I could drink more coffee and I could just, you know, brute force my way through anything. Then several promotions later, a couple of kids later, sick parents, you know, coming to stay with us. You know, personal complexity and professional complexity spiked at the same time. And I didn't have the tools, skills, or knowledge to manage it. Mm. So I'm like, I need a different way to manage all this. So that started me on a journey of studying a lot of different people, Peter Drucker, uh, Dr. Stephen Covey, David Allen. And David's book, I think, was pretty fresh at that point. So it was like the, the new thing on the marketplace. And I read that and it really resonated with me. So I started practicing it personally. I, I brought it in for my team, watch it help my team members. Um, and then I even started a blog just about life and and uh, running um, you know, a more you know, holistic, productive life using his methodology. And it was that blog that I started, well, actually started as an intention. Then I'm like, no, 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 I got to put this as a as a project. And then what's the next action, Mike? Oh, you got to sign up for Blogger and work all the way through. And then finally yeah. hit yeah. publish. Mm. Like yeah. you're hitting publish on the the podcast, so you have to hit publish like yeah. you know 30 times. And, and then I got a body of work and a couple of those things I'd send over to David. David would like them. Twitter was just starting at the time. So he had tweeted out, my readership would go up. Wow. And uh, that's where our relationship began. And give us a timeline of like when you first met David Allen and first started your blog and kind of which, you know, what anniversary that was. Is that like 07? It's probably 2008 ish. Okay. Yeah. Was it before the book had come? Because the book came out in 08, if memory serves. Did the book come out in 08? Um, um, well, you would know that. You're the boss. Two, well, <laughs> 2001, I think, is when... Oh, 2001. Getting, okay. Getting think, things done. I think that is true. Okay, gotcha. I didn't hear um, about because it Because it came out um, when 9-11 happened. Ah. Uh, so, so, so it was... His book was a slow ramp up as well. It wasn't like this instant right. success. It just landed at the right time when technology was taking off. Yeah. And the people in Silicon Valley love david's work yeah and um so um so you're hearing so about, about him in like 2008 okay uh 2009 ish uh david was in boston and he invited me down there to have lunch with him and he, he and his wife Catherine were there and they're like hey we're looking for a new ceo of our company and when we write our list uh you know you're at the top would you be interested in something like this and the interesting story about that is rewind the clock three months. My wife and I were sitting at the table and I had been with GE about 20 years at that point. And I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do next? Mm. Wow. And then, then we got in this conversation. And so we're living in Burlington, Vermont. So I, I said to myself that and to Ariana, my wife, I'd like to work for a small, funky company that's doing really good work in the world. And Ariana was like, I grew up in Burlington. I'm ready to move to a warm climate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then three months after that, I go down. I have this lunch with David and Catherine. They, they, they tell me they're interested in me. And would I be interested? And I'm like, yes, I would be interested. 
Yeah. And I left that conversation. I called Ariana. I'm like, guess you what? Won't believe what just happened. <laughs> Be careful what you ask the universe for, because it yeah. just might happen. <laughs> wow. How long did it take her to make up her mind to uh, leave her hometown of Burlington, Vermont? Not long at all. Sorry. But, what time of the year were you interviewing yeah, right. for the job? <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, so I ended up taking the job and I, we moved out to uh, Ojai in 2012. So there's, okay. you know, some time in between there. Yeah. But what I ended up having to do, though, this was n not an insignificant move for the family because we pulled our kids out of school halfway through the year in Vermont. Right. And then moved out to California and plugged them into school for the the second half of the year in California. So as a as a parent, I'm like, oh my goodness. As an individual, I was like, if not now, when? Sure. You know, as a married couple, as a parent, as a married like, couple, you're like, if not now, when? This is perfect, right? Yeah. But as a and parent, as a dad, I was like, I hope I don't screw up my kids forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then, but then I said. Kids are really resilient, so they <laughs> will do great. And this, and and that's a skill you need to learn in life, anyway. Yeah. So I'm like, and we're in this together as a family. So it was an adventure. Yeah. Um, everything went well. They love California. They love where we landed. And um, my experience at the David Allen Company was magical. Can't say enough great things about it. David's wonderful. The whole staff that I work with there, just spectacular people. Hey everybody, this is Jessica. I'm so excited to offer to you this new service and this ability that you have to text in your questions, comments. Maybe you have some situations that you'd love for Jeff and Jessica to try to tackle along with you. You can text us now at 203-646-1472. Your phone carrier may have standard rates that apply, it being a text, but this is a free service from us to you in which we would like to participate with you in an ongoing conversation about how we can help and what we can possibly do for you. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. That's fantastic. And then um, what what I I learned this from uh, a guy that I was working for at CA. Um, he said uh, basically, give me uh, you know if I had something to bring him, he said, give me three smart things about him, and I would uh, three smart things about whatever I was talking about. So I would uh, that's kind of our our thing that we do when we can on this on this podcast is can you give me three smart things about what you learned from your tenure working for David Allen, who some might think in the productivity world and as an author at his pinnacle was one of the most influential people in business. Yeah. Um, let me see a couple things. One, you know, I think David is one of the most um, authentic people that you will ever meet. So very grounded in who he is. Um, two, the value of making clear and crisp agreements with yourself and others and uh, holding those agreements, closing those loops. And then the, the third one would be the experiment we were trying at the David Allen Company, which was something called Holacracy, which is a self-organizing organization management system. So I came from... GE, which is really command and control yeah. system, yeah. going to a company that was trying um, something on the leading edge. And that's another thing about David. He's always a leading edge kind of thinker and trier. So when I joined them, they were in the midst of implementing this. So that was a whole kind of uh, mind shift on how to lead and that kind of system. And a little prequel to the next part of my story, when I joined Zappos, they were also practicing holacracy as well. So can you explain, kind of a, can you explain what holacracy means in not layman's yeah. terms, but, but, you know, fairly productive and, and basic terms? Yes. Um, 
Holacracy is grounded in purpose-driven organizations. And then the, the people who are within these organizations are first and foremost kind of members of the organization that take on roles that are needed to serve the purpose of the organization. And the idea is there's a governance structure where if somebody senses something new is emerging in the marketplace and we don't have a role to handle it, they can propose a role, make it happen, and then that role gets assigned to a human being. So there's it's not like a job description and then you fulfill the job description. It's very dynamic. You could hold a lot of different jobs over time based on the needs of the marketplace. So a contemporary example of this would be maybe you're sensing you need a chat GPT prompt engineer and you don't have one within, within your organization. Somebody would propose that, hey, we need this to remain competitive. And then somebody would be assigned that role or they'd go out and find a person who can do that work. Right, that so, the organization is vocalizing what they need. By, yeah, by what project work function. needs to be done yeah. to fulfill the purpose of the organization is, is kind of the bottom line. That's um, it, it, when I hear you talking about that, what, being in a home where we have seven children, I often have this conversation with friends who they, they're working so hard if they have more than one child to make everything fair. Like everybody has to have equal share of everything. And I, I just tell them flat out, I say, you know, That's not it's not about being it, in the house of seven. I can't be fair. I can't afford to evenly dispute dis you know, to disperse over seven children all the same, but we practice running our home in the point, in the point of view of it's what does the team need? What does the, what yeah. does the team need as a, as an entity? Because, you know, early on in our having children, we'd have one son invited to a birthday party at some, you know, awesome place like Chuck E. Cheese or something while the other son isn't invited. And it's not about telling the other parent, well, you have to invite my kid or we can't go. He can't enjoy this experience. It's about the team supporting the yeah. one that's yeah. going to Chuck E. Cheese and how can we be excited yeah. about it? There's, there's an example of that earlier this year. We had a wedding that uh, from a close family friend and they were trying to keep the guest list down for for cost reasons. And, and um, one, the, the groom that was getting married, he's very close friends with Andrew, very close, like BFF level friends. And so Andrew got invited to the wedding and uh, Washington, who is only 18 months of age different, also knows this person very well, also spent 10 years with him. Um, but Washington was not invited to the wedding, but offered to serve at the wedding, to volunteer as a, an usher and uh, help with food and stuff like that. And I thought that was a beautiful way of honoring them as a family and also brotherly love between the two that one was allowed the opportunity to attend as a guest and the other one's working as a volunteer usher. And, and yeah. that equates to other things too, like trips. Madeline and I went to go see the Van Gogh exhibit at the DIA in Detroit in January. Uh, she went to Disneyland. We're about to go to France together. She went to Disneyland and with you her guys, mom. You guys are saying, hey, the team, we're going to fill in roles. We've got kids yeah. that are going to do the role of mom. we got kids that are going to do the role of, you know, yeah. sister. And, and we're going to fill and in these roles. And we're going to support this event. And so I really like what you're saying about Holacracy. And I think that we probably subconsciously kind of is, uh, try to strive to run something like that in the house. And I'm glad that you put a name on it yeah, so that we can, yes. we can, we can see what that actually what, looks what like. What I was talking about with Madeline is that she's going, she's going, she went to the museum in January with me to go do the Van Gogh exhibit. Cause she wanted to go and we had to hit that time slot. Um, she went with her mom to go to uh, Disneyland for a girl's trip earlier this year also with Jessica one-on-one. -on -one. Then I took her to New York for her 21st birthday in September. Jessica's taking her to Paris for her 21st birthday. She's the only kid that's been on an airplane this year and she's gone for, you know, four trips, but you know, it's her 21st year and these are all opportunities in the calendar that make sense. And, um, and I don't think the other kids have felt slighted because they all get to do fun stuff too. And this is what Madeline needed this year. The team needed to come together to support Madeline having a great year of travel um, so the holacracy, um, if I'm saying that right, holacracy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can think of it 
as um, adaptive systems, really. Okay. You know, in, in the industry, it's called complex adaptive systems or dynamic organizations okay. that flex as needed. And um, so this is kind of like, you know, one of the one of the root points in um, in doing to done is is it always works in current reality. Not what we wished were true, but what is true. Mm. And current reality is a beautiful constraint. And then you organize your work and your roles to handle the current reality. So, that. you know, families and Jessica's example are just wonderful examples. And, and your son's example of how to take that constraint and use his creativity to find a new way to express his love for his friend and his brother. Yeah. Wonderful. Just spectacular. Yeah. That's the creativity that's available to us all. You know, if you look at current reality as a beautiful constraint, yeah. you may want to make a beautiful dinner tonight, but when you open up your pantry, you just <laughs> got peanut butter and jelly. Right. Then you're going to make the most creative peanut butter and jelly you can make today because that's your constraint. Well, and and so speaking to, I want to I want to be able to deal as we weave in aspects of the book. The book, by the way, folks. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by, no, it's not sponsored by, <laughs> no. this podcast is uh, brought to you by a desire to help improve your life. And the way that we do that is by reading books. And one of the books that we're talking about this week is Doing to Done by Mike Williams. What is the tagline? Productivity made simple. Productivity made simple. Thank you. For busy people like us. For, and, <laughs> and we are all very busy. Lots of things yeah. on our plates. I want to I wanna have opportunities for you to weave these stories in about the book. If you haven't read the book, I've read it a couple of times. I've got it on Kindle. You can order it on Amazon. Um, you can buy it for a friend. It is written with amazing pictures. Pictures break down and make very simple the concepts that he's sharing. It's the book is mostly pictures and a handful. It's just a handful of copy on each page, just a little bit. Um, but if as we go through your story, you're at GE, you're living in Farmington, Vermont, which people in the California think it's great. And at Christmas time, it's probably awesome. But the other four months, you have to live with the snow where there's no Christmas. Uh, maybe not as much. And then you make this pivot to Southern California, go to work for David Allen, and then. As David Allen transitions in his career and business into his his current status, and the 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 company ends up you know becoming acquired, um, you have an opportunity to go and work with Tony Shea in Las Vegas. And I, the, the late Tony Shea, um, was a phenomenal business leader from everything that I can tell, from a humanitarian perspective, from a giving back perspective, embedded into the shoes. You know, the pairs of shoes. You buy a pair of shoes, you get a pair of shoes given given to somebody in need. Um, I I don't want to make it as as uh, simple as tell us three smart things, but I would love to just hear you stream of consciousness talk about. What did you learn by being invited to come and be a part of this amazing business to be working with a, a multi-billionaire founder in his 30s? And then you got to, I mean, we can't not talk about the llama and the apartment in uh, the the Airstream trailers that he that he did uh, after he realized that, you know, living in a gated community on the country club is is not necessarily where it's at. And I think that current reality and the pull for community and that sense of cohesion in the people that you're sharing your life with, uh, I am I am so enthralled in anything that you care to share about that experience. Obviously what you're comfortable with, not looking for any private conversations that are off limits, but anything that you can share about that period of time, tell us the story of your life consulting with Zappos and living in the Airstream commune in downtown Las Vegas four days a week. <laughs> yeah. And um, so just to end the David Allen story, David Allen wasn't acquired. They, no, they me. transitioned from a professional services organization to a licensing organization. So they're, they've licensed um, That's right. getting things done through crucial learning which is one of their key partners now. Gotcha. And, Thank you. And so, um, yeah. So uh, Holacracy was the, was the leap over to, from the David Allen company to uh, Zappos. My first introduction with Tony was actually going in as a keynote speaker for one of their 
uh, all hands meetings, famous all hands meetings. I mean, these these meetings were spectacular. The, uh, it was at the Ka Theater in Las Vegas. So I'm I'm on the Cirque du Soleil stage. You know, <laughs> I was like, wow, this is amazing. And um, but after that, and as part of that journey before I joined um, Zappos, Tony was walking me around downtown Las Vegas and and um, sharing part of his vision. And the one thing that struck with me as he was pointing out different things, Vegas was still really rough downtown at this time. But his vision was to create the conditions for stores and and restaurants and businesses to start popping up. Why? What was his design principle? I want to create um, the ability for people to collide and exchange ideas. I want to create the conditions for people to collide and, and exchange ideas. And he even had a measure for it. Like Tony had a measure for everything. Collisions per square foot is what he was after in downtown Las Vegas. So if you know that going into it, when you go to downtown Las Vegas today, Zappos is downtown. All these beautiful uh, small businesses are downtown. Tourists are mixing with locals, which are mixing with Zappos people. When Zappos has a all hands meeting, you'll get coupons to go downtown to spend it in the local restaurants to collide with your colleague or a tourist saying, what are you up to? Oh, we work for Zappos. Oh, what's that about? So this was a genius, genius move on, on Tony's part. And even at Zappos, when you walk into the, the building, every other floor had a soda machine and every other floor had the snack machine. So if you wanted a, a soda, you, <laughs> you had to go to, up a floor. If you wanted a soda or, and a snack, you had to go exactly, up or down sure. a floor. Yeah. So everything was designed around that. And then wow. once you get into Zappos, um, the purpose of Zappos is probably the most beautiful purpose statement I've ever heard. And that is to live and deliver wow. Mm. So if you can make a person go, wow, that that is the, the most beautiful, kindest, loving thing mm. that you can do because you did something to, you, you can almost not help yourself by saying, wow, or oh. And so the customer support professionals there are, are call, call center people, people in finance, everybody. We were trained to create wow moments for our colleagues, for our customers, for our community. And that just stuck with me forever. And then the other thing about Zappos is it is the most diverse workforce you'll ever work for by design. Really? So hiring diverse people, um, training these people up and sprinkling on, um, on top of that diversity, one of the, the core values was uh, have fun and, and a little weirdness. <laughs> so not only be diverse, but show us your freak flag and come on in and be yourself. Yeah. So it was so wild and chaotic that the normal was the exception. Wow. But people could show up and, and just kind of be. And the uh, so that's the culture. That's the culture of Zappos. And then the business layer of Zappos was built on this foundation that a you are a smart, creative human being. B, if you have an idea, we would love for you to plug it into the system to see if it can turn into something for us. And Tony created this system with you know a lot of other people at Zappos called Market-Based Dynamics, where he actually set up Zappos to run like a mini economy. Different departments would invoice other departments for services delivered. So implied in that is, A, you have a customer. B, do you know what they want? And C, will they pay for your services? Yeah. So through this, he was training and teaching people, you know, the art of business. Because I don't know about you, 
I didn't grow up from a business pedigree. My dad was a teacher and a coach. And so we had a lot of people in, in Zappos, uh, the call center, smart, really creative people, but they just didn't have that background. But if you invest in people and train them and teach them and help them experiment, try and fail and try again, understanding it's just not a one-shot wonder kind of thing, it's a practice, going back to our earlier point. It's a practice that has practices that has practices. And if you can get educated on it, you try and you learn, then uh, really good things can emerge. So he had a vision of creating a Zappos where there were small, medium, and large sized businesses in this ecosystem that kind of runs like a city where everybody uses each other's services. And then out of that came some really good uh, business solutions for Zappos. And even to this day, I have colleagues that started small businesses at Zappos that when Tony left and things went down, they have small businesses now outside of Zappos. Wow. That's so awesome. Um, really, really powerful experience. Take, take that if you can to yeah. his decision. And I, if I'm telling the story wrong, please correct me. But as I understood it, he, he sells Zappos to Amazon, makes a billion dollars and buys the big house at the end of the street behind the gate on the golf course in Vegas. That's the dream for anybody coming up and go by the big house. And he, and he does all of this, closes escrow, moves to the house, lives there. And then it's like crickets. And he's like, I'm not getting any collisions per square foot in this big monster house. And then he goes and he buys this old motel in downtown Las Vegas and buys what a dozen or a dozen and a half, uh, airstream trailers rents them out, lives in one himself, and then has one next door or a couple doors down that he makes as a corporate apartment, which you then occupied three or four days a week. What was that like? I mean, you must have had gut-splitting laughter and music and just crazy because you're doing the collisions per square foot thing, but you're doing it you know, in your life, like at night when you're done working for the day. Yeah. Um, I, I was on the um, kind of the end of his journey in the suburbs coming to to Vegas. So I met Tony when he was first doing the Airstream experiment and it was in a parking lot at first. Oh, OK. So then he he purchased a bunch of different Airstreams and um, he would invite people to stay there. A community formed. And so that was the first version. So Airstream version one was just in a parking lot wow. with uh, with a bandstand and people and all kinds of fun stuff. Then he purchased uh, Ferguson's, it's, is the motel downtown off of Fremont Street. Yep. And then that became the, uh, the Ferguson community. And um, so that community, the, the tagline is, is uh, rooted in love. And so the idea there was to create, we had Airstreams and tiny homes. And then within that community, you had a percentage of people that were full-time residents. And then you had a handful of Airstream and tiny homes that were reserved for guests to come in. So we had speakers coming in as Apple's for the all hands meeting, they would stay there or we had, you know, consultants come in, they would stay there. So they could not only get the experience, but one of the hallmark design things of that was there was this fire pit in the middle and people would just hang at the fire pit, sit down, collide and exchange ideas and there was this llama walking around, Marley. And if you weren't care careful, he had nibbling your ear. But, um, Marley the llama. I love it. So can, he was really an alpaca, but we an don't. An alpaca. Okay. Can, can I ask, um, in your experience as an observer, you're such a good observer. You're able to really bring back and recall so many experiences. Um, mm -hmm. Is this ability that these people, this community had to hang out at the fire pit. Is this a result of having applied the power of stress-free productivity? Like because they have now done the practices and have the peace of mind and they've 
they can successfully now sit at the fire pit? Or was the majority of the people that you were observing just, um, you know, we look, let's be real. I'm a parent. I, I look at children sometimes who happen to look as if they're being lazy and it ends up becoming yeah. a shirking kind of a feel. Like, is are these people, is this just this utopia in which all of these people are sitting around the fire pit because they're so successful at getting things done, they've got everything marked off their list and now they can have, you know, five o'clock comes and they've clocked out and they're at the fire pit. Is that the majority of the people that you found that were applying these things or is this... A 50-50 thing? Is it a 80-20 rule? What what have you experienced in all these years of observing and working at this utopic way of living? Yeah, I, I don't know if it was, I, I would describe it as utopic, but from the outside, it's kind of really yeah. funky. <laughs> um, but in the community, there were owners of, of small bars, a DJ, you know, had a Bitcoin person, had a Facebook ad person, um, all kinds of different people doing, working small businesses and jobs. Some worked at Zappos, some didn't. So these are real humans just, you know, living day in and day out. Um, from a productivity standpoint, Tony was one of the most um, well-organized, productive people that I know. Mm. And the way that he would uh approach productivity is one of the key aspects of having a good system is doing some kind of review. We call it a weekly review, both in doing to done and, and uh, getting things done has a weekly review as well. But the notion is once we pause for a couple hours, look backwards on what you accomplished and look forward to what needs to be accomplished, what's coming at you. So Tony invited people to come in on Fridays and do a review with him, however they wanted to do it for, for their life. If they had questions, he would answer, but he, he was not dogmatic or anything like that. He, he created the conditions for these things to show up for people who were attracted to it. And then one of my roles in the community was if people wanted to learn more about these systems, I would sit down one-on-one -on -one and just do coaching. I do coaching over coffee. I would do coaching <laughs> over drinks. I would just do coaching at the, you know, over the fire pit, whatever. It was nice because it wasn't like your traditional coaching. It was more, let's work on your life over time and do it in little bits and pieces. And actually that's, that's where a lot of where, we're doing to done came from was distilling down the 20% of the items that matter most. Mm. And I left a lot on the editing floor. We can always double click and go deeper, but what gets people started in a nice, uh, friendly, kind to self way, right? There's enough. The world will beat you up enough. You don't need to beat yourself up. So let's. So my job was to help people find their internal wisdom and say, "You got this. You see, you found it. Yeah. I didn't do anything. I just asked a question, and you found it. So if you ask this question of yourself when I'm not here, I bet you'll find yeah. something else again. So simple, repeatable, and then predictable is what I was after. So can, let's can we get these. Let's start. A little predictable. Um, I'm really excited to double click on this and I want to take it through a, um, a, a standard operating procedure from, if you think about Dan Rome and you think about the folding of the napkin, right? You have, if your yeah. book is the full Monty, that's, that's the full napkin folded all the way out. Let's fold the napkin in half and then let's fold it in half again and do like our three by three. Let's do a three by three overview. And I have an idea for a way to ask you this and see if it's right. And then let's unfold it one more. And then for those that are listening that want to see the full Monty, I think they can, they can double down on it and, and get the book and read it. But when I think of the three inch by three inch, I think of two things uh, for planning and project management. I think about the toggling. I think about toggling back and forth between the wide angle lens of the weekly review where you're going to look at what's working, what's not working, and what are my long-term goals. And then I also think about what needs to happen on a daily basis where you're in the middle of a sprint or the middle of a week 
or the middle of a very busy series of calendars to where a weekly review really isn't appropriate and you need to be focused and take us through like bits, which I thought was super valuable. By the way, you got me wearing my Apple Watch because I put my five-minute timer on in order to do the bits. But is that is that a good framework to approach that three-inch by three-inch um, cocktail napkin, 100,000-foot view, or do we have an even better one than that? You know, where I start is I have uh, kind of in the, the three category, but it's the three most powerful question that I ask people. Okay. Number one is what's and on your mind. I know that one. Absolutely. That's the first yep. place because that establishes current reality. I told you I read the book. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's what, what's, what's on your, on your what's mind? What's on your mind? And folks out there, take out a piece of paper if you want to and follow along because Mike Williams shows you how to do it. Yeah. And, and then like just set a timer for five minutes and, and I do recommend limiting it to five minutes yeah. to capture what's on your mind, write it down, you know, your birthdays, anniversaries, projects, you know, relationships, you know, whatever it is that's on your mind. The act of writing it down takes it from a swirl where you have to name it, claim it and write it down. And in that act, you're using different parts of your brain to get to That's that right. end state That's of that right. thing written down. So for most people, that looks like their to-do list. It's it's just a list of stuff that was randomly on their mind. Now, the second question is for something that's on that list that you need to handle. And this is absolutely the, the most powerful question of all the ones that, that I ask. And you can stop here and just do this for the rest of your What's life. What's the next which action? Is, What's the one next action yeah. you need to move it forward? And there's a very prescriptive way to write that action. And that is with a doing verb, an action verb, call, schedule, draft, and then the target, the phrase. And that right there turns the complexity into clarity. Target phrase. Give me that. Let's double click on that for those that may not know. So that basically is the doing statement. What is doing look so like? So let's say wash, verb, wash my car. If I need to wash my car, wash car the next action on that, contract. the next action on that would be buy, you know, buy a detergent for my car. It could be if you don't have it in the garage already. Yeah. yeah. So um, how would you, how would you write stuff, it? I want to get, be, I want to get real specific. Yeah. Give me an example mm -hmm. specifically of the verbiage of how do you write the next action out for that second question? Well, the construct is a verb plus a phrase. A uh, verb plus so a I, phrase. Okay. Yeah. And and you can think of these. Um, so, for example, if I'm working on an engagement that I'm trying to close, all right, engagement, uh, I'm trying to close this deal. So what's the one next action, Mike, that you need to close this deal? If you think about it, you'll be like, I either need to call somebody, I need to draft somebody, I need to email somebody, I need to text somebody, or perhaps you're waiting for a piece of information to come back. There is an action to be taken or you're actively waiting. Yeah. Period. So, so email Bob the contract, right? Let's say your contract's right. drafted and your next action is to send Bob an email. It's email Bob the contract for him to review. That's your next action, right? Your, your, your responsibility, your commitment to yourself or to Bob is to email that contract. Yep. So we've, we've gone from, from complexity or chaos of just having Bob on your list to specifics. Oh, I need to email Bob. Yep. And then the third question is, what does done look like? So that's why the name of the book is, is doing to done. Yep. What does done look like? Why is Bob in your life? And the reason Bob's in my life is I need to close the deal with GE or deal with yep. GE close, deal with Facebook, wherever he works. Do you have an algorithm for okay. writing what done looks like? So done is a phrase and a, kind of like a project verb, completed, fixed, resolved, implemented, published, um, closed, yep. uh, resolved, final. So those paint a picture of what the finish line looks like. I love it. So just in those three questions, what's on your mind, what's doing look like, and what's done look like, uh, particularly the doing and done statements, 
you'll start to see a list of agreements you've made with yourself or others emerge. And it's really clear. And you can think of the doing statements as love notes to your future self. So when you pick up that list, you know, a day from now and you look at it, that doing statement is so specific and so precise and so on mark. It's like a micro instruction. Yeah. Uh, if an actor, if a director said action, this is what the actor would do in the scene. Call Bob. Right. So, and then, so that's and then why it's so help, powerful. help me with this. If I go, uh, uh, and I've done this exercise multiple times in the last couple of weeks, going through your book and preparing for this time right here. So I could see what's it feel like? What's the visceral connective experience of actually doing the stuff that you're talking about? Um, yeah. getting the stuff out of your mind to me, that is a, a very much a right brain activity, even though you're using language, but it's a right brain activity and I'm just doing bubble maps, right? I'm just throwing random circles and naming them all over my paper. But then to go from that to what's the next action I have personally, I need to move that into a table, either a, a, a line or some type of Excel sheet. Uh, you can use paper for it, but it needs to be much more linear where you have, you know, a row of tasks and then a row of next actions or a row of projects and a row of next actions. Where, how do you structure this third portion that says like, take, take me like start to finish from, um, um, I've got an RFP that I'm working on, for example. And so RFP is on my mind, just RFP. That's part one. That's, that's on my mind. Then I go to step two, which is what's the next action in order to, um, in order to move it forward. And I need to email, um, we'll, we'll just say Bob. Um, I need to yeah. email Bob by the end of the day and I need to get an update from Bob on the questions that they need to prepare, which are part of my RFP response. And then the third, which was what does done look like is a phrase plus a completed verb. When we say what does done look like, would that be uh, Bob sends me, uh, Bob sends me the answers or Bob sends me the questions because that's what done is like. Or are we, what is the RFP being done look like? More on the RFP being done. Okay. So, so we're, when will okay. this, when will this bigger loop be closed? Okay. So then that would be send an email to Bob to, um, to get an update on the questions to be submitted with the RFP. And then, yep. then, how do we connect? How do we provide the connective tissue and between that and we win the RFP? Well, that's your desired end state. So that's, that's your goal. So RFP submitted is probably um, what you're up okay. to or engagement gotcha. resolved or loop closed with that customer somehow. Okay. So that's the finish line. Okay. And then how would, a, maker, how would that be? How would that be represented in a table? So if I have an Excel sheet, the way I've always done it is I have a project name in column A, and then I have next action in column B. Do we have that's fine. do we have phrase plus completed verb for column C? Um, no the the um, the RFP submitted. Let's pretend that that's a phrase. I would have at the top of that column done. Yeah, that's the done phrase. And what does doing look like? Um, that is email Bob, and that's the minimum viable product for building momentum in your life. You know, sometimes, if you, if since we're in a, a spreadsheet metaphor, yeah. like if you were to expand and put columns in between the done and the doing, yeah, that's where there may be other commitments you've made to others to update Salesforce, so on and so forth with pipeline information and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But but if you were to close it all and get to the essence of it, what's doing look like and what's done look like. What's doing look like and what's and, done look like. I love yeah, that. And the clearer you are on doing, yeah. the clearer, the more momentum you will create for yourself. You'll bust through resistance. You'll bust through overwhelm. You'll bust through overthinking. And then you'll get yourself into action. And when you take an action, you ping the universe and it will reply with information. That's right. But it's not going to give you that information until you take that action. So we've just covered the planning portion of it. Let's talk about the execution piece with your bits. I think that is a 
fantastic summary of how you can actually get over the hump, right? One of the things in David Allen's book that you pointed out to me that was really helpful um, was that the probability of success of an activity is directly related to the motivation to take action to get it done. And that's, that's, in other words, if we break something down into the minimum viable product, that's the simplest it could possibly be. There's no ambiguity about it. It's totally clear. And it's something I could see doing in say five minutes or 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about the philosophy in the book that you describe with regard to in doing and when on the exit yeah. of, uh, of these bits and, and how that ties between the planning and the actual execution. Your probability of success will increase, not based on motivation, but clarity of that statement. Right. And what so I was. If you have a very clear next action, then you don't need motivation. Exactly. What I was saying was that the motivation to do a thing is based right. on how probable your success is. In other words, if my probability of success is low because there's no clarity, my motivation to take action is nothing. There's then more resistance. There's more resistance. Like exactly. Exactly right. So um, in the book, I, I when you're left with a list of actions that you can take, these love notes to your future self, um, my observation has been, you know, in broad brushstroke terms, that there are three ways to take those actions. And I package them into beats is, is what it's called. Beats. So there's micro beats. So things that you can do in under five minutes. There's like a main work beat, like doing a sprint of holding your focus for 15 minutes. And then there's deep work work beats where, for example, in your RFP, you might need to work on that for 30, 60, 90 minutes and do some deep work. Those are the three main brushes in this toolkit. So some folks find it helpful to uh, make an agreement with themselves that I'm going to hold my focus for an agreed upon period of time, five minutes, let's say. And so the idea is to walk in and pick up that first next action and work on it. And then if the five minute timer is what you choose, when that five minutes is up, say high five to self because I kept an agreement to hold my focus on this for five minutes without being distracted. I kept that agreement with myself. Therefore, my self-confidence starts to rise because I know I can keep an agreement with myself. Right. Now, at the end of that five minutes, you may or may not be done. If you're not done, just click for another five and do another sprint. So this is a tool to help people get into action. I don't know about you, but I... I found myself on TikTok way longer than I expected. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so uh, uh, sometimes I need to say, hey, I need to break out of this and I need to get my focus back over here. So yeah. I set a timer for five minutes on something I agreed I need to do to create momentum. <laughs> well, and we see people go ahead, Jessica. What was that? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Um, we see people yeah. who have literally had transformative life experiences from understanding how whatever game they have to play with themselves in order to break the initiative in order to start action. Uh, two examples I can think of off the top is Mel Robbins does a great talk in impact theory about the five second rule. And she literally goes from an alcoholic who can't get out of bed after 12 alarms going off to get her kids to the bus on time with a failing marriage and a couple of pizza restaurants that weren't doing well after she dropped out of being a public figure to says as she goes before bed, you know, kind of in a drunken stupor, uh, she watches a rocket mortgage commercial and says, that's what I'm going to do next morning. I'm going to blast out of bed like a rocket. Ah. Right. And then she wakes up in the morning and she goes five, four, three, two, one, blast off. <laughs> but she puts her feet over the bed at the first alarm, gets her kids on the bus. And she was like, that worked. What, what is that? How did that, how did I go? All of a sudden I'm taking action because I made a momentum and effectively it sounds like what she did was she made an agreement with herself on something she could accomplish in a few minutes 
the probability of success goes way up. So the the barrier of entry for motivation is is very low. She's able to take action. Her confidence goes up. And now here we are just a few years later, not only sold millions of copies of her book, not only has a Sirius XM radio show, but I think is the highest paid public speaker in the world, male or female, at something like $275,000 per keynote speech, all based on this concept of overcoming the inertia to get things going. A uh, second example of that was the billionaire insurance magnate who co-authored um, the uh, success book with Napoleon Hill called, um, I'm, I'm missing my punchline here, W. Clement Stone and Napoleon Hill published a book that I read years ago on success. It was basically the book that pulled Napoleon Hill out of bankruptcy. And uh, his, his three-step move is inspiration to action, do it now. The prompter, do it now. If he thinks of something, he says, do it now. I have to obey that voice of do it now. And that got him over the hump and literally made him a billionaire in the insurance business. And so can you talk a little bit about what the setting of the timer or the bits, anything related to cognitive science or why that's so effective to setting a timer and knowing, okay, I can suffer through just about anything for five minutes, whether it's paying my taxes or having a root canal, whatever it is, right? Yeah, so the... I, the the big idea here with Mel Robbins, with Do It Now, with the two minute rule, is defining a beautiful constraint that works for you, whatever that is. That's you know, the magic um, of it. Is the constraint itself? It's the collisions yeah, the, per. The constraint itself is you're defining a nice, beautiful dojo or gym or studio to walk into. That you've made an agreement with yourself. When I walk into this construct that I've created, the rule is this. And when I do this rule, I keep an agreement with myself. And if I do it and something positive happens, then you're forming yeah. this, this reinforcing loop that works for you. And one of the key concepts in doing to done is helping people discover your trusted system. Because you can implement a Mel Robbins type of approach. You can implement a workbeat type of approach. You can implement a different kind of approach. The goal is to find the systems that work for you. And everybody's system is going to be a little different. So this is this is kind of like um, the base Lego board is doing to done. And then you can build systems on top of it that work for Jeff because you need Jeff systems and Jessica needs Jessica systems and your son Andrew needs Andrew systems and they are different and your nervous systems are different and your comfort zones are different. So we need to honor that diversity. And so that's what the pursuit of this is in doing to done is helping you find the 20% of the activities that create 80% of the value for you. How do you, and if you can name it, a, claim it, that's a beautiful promise. It's simple. That's a beautiful promise. Yeah. How do you find the 20% that gets you the 80%? Well, you, you start with the first three steps and, and start externalizing stuff. So a different part of your brain can show yeah. up. So I would say ABCD, always be collecting dots. Second round of ABCD, always be connecting dots. Mm -hmm. What are the patterns you're seeing for yourself? You know, I want to respect Mike's time. I know we've been talking for a long time. It's been over an hour. Um, but as we're kind of winding down and Told closing, you. it's geeks, it's, closing it's things out. Well, we're just going to have to, ha we're just out gonna have to do more. Yeah, part two. Yeah, with Mike exactly. Williams part next two. Week. No. <laughs> my, my kind of question as we as we wind down and as we end up at this talk is we're of a certain age where we've been applying these things. We've been, you know, I would say more or less consistently productive and, and getting things done is not, a, we're not stranger to it. We actually get quite a, quite a bit done. How do you encourage yeah. those of us? And I have some really close friends that, that they're at that, you know, they're stalled. They just, they, there's nothing to do. They don't, they get to this point to where everything's pretty good on autopilot. Like they're hap they're good with good. And, and we can't, you know, motivate them to be great. We can't, you know, you know, but yet they're still kind of scratching their, the back of their neck thinking I'm in my fifties, I'm in my sixties. And is this it? Like, how do you encourage people to dream again and to, to actually 
get back to the basics of getting things done because there's stuff to do. How do you encourage them to find stuff to do? Yeah. When, um, if they're having that struggle at the low, lower level of finding stuff to do, then we need to go up to a higher level. Um, perspective to ask, you know, higher questions. Mm. And so in doing to done, there's, there's a map called the role clarity map. Mm. So what are the different roles you hold in your life? And what's the purpose of the role? What's your vision of success for that role? And these are questions that people often have not answered. You know, what is your vision of wild success for being a mom or for yourself mm or being an entrepreneur or a friend. And if you can define those, then you enchant each of those roles with a story. And now you can start living into that story that you've defined for yourself. And that's a powerful place to work it. from. But if you're lost and you don't have that story, nobody else can create it but you. So you have to spend a little time at the higher horizon to think That's about this. Awesome. One, one question you. in closing, I, I, I have to ask this. Uh, it has, yeah. it has become, I've, I've compared algorithms of fighter pilots, NFL, uh, championship coaches, uh, Napoleon dealing with, uh, ailing soldiers lying, lying in field hospitals. And one of the things that I found that I, that I have not been doing is I always thought play offense, play offense, play offense. But all these algorithms for success in sports, in war, they all have to do with playing defense. It's kind of the Covey A1, like do the A1s first, right? How, how important in your success have you experienced and seen with p the people you've coached and the billionaires that you've been around um, with the, the adage of take care of the downside and the upside takes care of itself. What are your, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think the, um, the, the idea of the first three questions, what's on your mind and building up the action list and, and uh, the doing list and the done list gives you an, a, an inventory of the agreements that you've made with yourself mm, and with others. Yeah. And if you review that periodically, weekly, and you get comfortable with all these open loops you've created for yourself, then that enables the space to walk away from that and do nothing yeah. guilt-free yeah. or do anything serendipity with joy and not carry the guilt that, oh, I need to be doing this or that or this or that because I haven't clarified yeah. what this or that and is. And your commitments by reviewing those commitments on a regular basis and kind of knowing, oh, there's like nothing, nothing's going to get me because all my, my, all my commitments have been reviewed at least a week, if not sooner. They've been reviewed. Right. They're not on your mind. And that kind of brings us full circle to the fact that you did take an hour with me with no notice out of the middle of your day as the CEO of the David Allen company back in 2014. And we met and sat and chatted and had a great conversation, totally impromptu. It was, I would definitely qualify that as serendipitous. Um, and, serendipitous, and I didn't yeah. feel guilty about it and you didn't, you didn't show any care or concern or worry. And that was so refreshing to me to experience you being present with me, just like you are right now, where we have a friendship and rapport and almost 10 years together under our belt. But I've been experiencing this with you since, since hour one of an impromptu conversation that we had in 2014. So I just want you to know, Mike, you're absolutely living the values that you talk about in your book, number one, you've been living them for 10 years that I've known you. It's the absolute antithesis of that opening conversation with your wife over an anniversary dinner where you weren't present. And uh, folks, if you're out there, and I, and I remember from our, our podcast, and I'll post the link to the David Allen podcast too, um, that we did, but here we are 10 years later, and there's, there's a new book on the table that I want you guys to, to get it. Please buy the book and use it to educate yourself about how you can be more present because that was the real yield that this journey has, has given to myself and to Jessica is putting a, a, a real premium on being present with the people in your life that you care about and then giving you the infrastructure and the tools to review all of the commitments that Mike just articulated, the commitments that we've made in our life to Visa card, to our car payment, all those commitments, if you review those on a, on a often enough basis, 
it does take away the guilt of being present with people and doing things that, you know, really, um, it's okay to do nothing sometimes, right. And be yeah. present with people. So, um, I, Mike, I have so much respect for you in business. Um, any closing comments or words, how can people find you and what are you up to with your consulting business in your book? So closing thoughts, um, just remember that you have thoughts, you have actions, but you are not your thoughts and you are not your actions. <laughs> That's right. So, so there's a little separation there and, and that separation is a good thing because it helps you to see yourself differently. So that's, that's what this is cultivating is your ability to step out and then step back into the game. Uh, people can reach me at Mike at doing to done.com. That's D O I N G T O D O N E.com. And the website is um, doing to done.com. And there's um some workshops coming up in December, December 5th through 7th and January 9th through 11th of 2023. Are those posted on the website or on a calendar somewhere they can find? Yeah. Okay. And uh, and then if you purchase uh, the book, the book was designed to be uh, fun, visual, engaging, and joyful, and something that, uh, Jessica, to your point, that you could gift to another and what I've been surprised by is people writing back saying, I finished this book. I don't finish. <laughs> That's books. right. That's right. That's awesome. I've got, you know, 200 books here on my shelf. And I, this is the one that I finished because I was 20 pages into it. And, and I was like, wow, I've, I've done this. I understand yeah. this. So it can sneak up on you. And I have a few people delightful. that I will be ordering the book for Absolutely. that I'm already thinking of. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and there might be one of my children in there as well. <laughs> Buy one for me. Give me another copy. Oh, I've okay. got mine on Kindle, right. but I could use a hardback <laughs> copy. Uh, Mike, well, thank you we so love much. you. Yes. We're so grateful that you're here. Congratulations on your success and, and transitioning like we all do. This book is about bringing, this podcast is about bringing the humanities to entrepreneurship. And I couldn't think of a better example, a poster child, of someone that we know and love and appreciate and have watched embody those values of the humanities in your entrepreneurial journey. So Mike Williams, thanks so much for being with us here on the Jeff Heilman Project. And we'll see you again soon. Buy the book, folks. It's awesome. Buy it as a gift. We got Christmas coming up. Yes. And uh, make sure and reach out to Mike Williams if you're in a corporate situation where you need professional speaking, coaching, or training for your salespeople or your organization. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, everybody. See Thank you, you next Mike. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks for you having bet. me. Bye bye. Bye bye.